This morning's reading is from Hosea 1 and Hosea 2, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned No Mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God, and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say to you, brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters you have received mercy. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning. It's a good day to be in church this morning. We're starting the book of Hosea, and it's always hard to catch up when you've missed the introduction. Uh, the book of Hosea is the first and longest book in the scroll of the 12 prophets, which was always traditionally copied together as one unit. And these books are often referred to as the minor prophets, uh, not because they are less significant, but because they are much shorter when compared to the uh, major prophets like Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Hosea is by far the largest of the minor prophets. And the collection of the prophetic writings in the Old Testament are astounding because as God's covenant prosecutors, as the ones telling God's people what they were doing wrong, the prophets are hardly flattering when they address the people of God as unfaithful covenant breakers. So these writings were not collected because people appreciated what the prophets had to say. In fact, many times they killed the prophet for saying such things. But because what they predicted, at least in part, came true. And so the veracity or truthfulness of these prophecies was established after the fact, when later generations recognized their authenticity and added them to the collection of provably true predictions. What people gathers all the most horrible things people have ever said about them? 
You know, pe- people talk about different uh, writings, different uh, books considered spiritual in the world. There's nothing like the Bible where they're collecting, you know, here's another guy who said a whole bunch of terrible things about this. That was all true. Let's keep that. Oh, here, here's another guy who just said nothing but terrible things about us, but it was all true. Let's keep that one too. You know, other, other nations, other religions have books that promote them and talk about how great they are, how they're superior to other peoples and other races. Not so the book uh, that we have, the Bible, it has some terrible things to say about God's people. The benefit to us today of these ancient prophecies, which have already been realized in many ways, is that biblical prophecy contains much more than near future prediction. There is a, a timeless value to these passages Uh, Because as the covenant prosecutors, the prophets point out the ways in which God's people are unfaithful to the covenant. Ways in which we fail to honor God as God and give him thanks. The sins that entice humanity have not changed in the past 4,000 years. And neither has God changed in this time. The prophets disclose God's self-revelation. God reveals himself in what he communicates through these oracles. In Hosea, we will see that God is like a jealous husband when it comes to his people. He will not abide their infidelity. But God is also a devoted spouse, faithful to his own, even though they are faithless. Another reason the prophets remain relevant is that though their prophecies and and predictions begin to be fulfilled even within their own lifetimes, these prophecies are still not yet fully filled. It's a key characteristic of biblical prophecy that there is almost always a a nearly immediate fulfillment so that the the validity of the prophet is well established. Everyone knows, okay, he wrote this. It then came true, so that's a true prophet. And then there are later and greater fulfillments, sometimes of the very same statements, so that they are further filled in the coming of Christ Jesus. And we today are still looking forward to their final fulfillment the last day of Christ's return when they will be fully filled. So this is something we can think about in the terms of Old Testament prophecy. The prophecy is fulfilled and fulfilled some more and fulfilled some more and fulfilled some more. There's a a continual filling until they are fully filled as they are fulfilled. And so Hosea begins the same way as most of the prophetic books do, the word of the Lord that came to, and then the name of the prophet. If we include the slight variation, the word of the Lord came to the prophet, this formula introduces the vast majority of biblical prophetic writings and is repeated over a hundred times throughout. But this opening statement, the word of the Lord came to, is further clarified in verse 2, the Lord spoke through Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea. And so it becomes clear that the Lord did not simply address the prophet in a common way, but furnished him with instructions that he might afterwards teach the people, as it were, in the person of God himself. Hosea speaks and he says, thus says the Lord, and then he speaks in the first person for God to God's people. As Peter wrote, 1 Peter 20 to 21, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so God did not just speak to Hosea or just happen to use what Hosea wrote in his own mind, but God spoke in Hosea, through Hosea. Hosea brought forth nothing from his own brain. On this depends the whole authority of God's servants, that they do not give themselves loose reins, but faithfully deliver exactly what the Lord has commanded them without adding anything whatsoever of their own. Verse 1 begins, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Now, 
Implicit in Hosea's name is the emphasis of this book on God's salvation and the undeserved deliverance of his people. Hosea, or Hoshua, as it was pronounced, is a variant of Joshua, or Yeshua, meaning Yahweh saves. And it was a name as appropriate to his life and message as it was unsuited to another Hosea, Israel's last weak and unsuccessful king. And his ill-fated policies contributed to his kingdom's collapse in 722 to 721 BC, which was one of the fulfillments of the prophecy found in this book. The superscription of the book of Hosea names four kings of Judah and one of Israel. And this is interesting because Jeroboam was not the only king of Israel during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. As an oracle against the northern tribes of Israel, the author uses the kings of Judah to establish the timeline, while with the kings of Israel, he zeroes in on Jeroboam II, who was the last king of Israel with any shred of legitimacy. He was assassinated, and others usurped the throne. And by focusing on Jeroboam, Hosea establishes that he began to teach while things were still going very well for the kingdom of Israel. He threatened vengeance and calamity to a people who were flourishing in their wealth and power. While Jeroboam was enjoying his triumphs and people were still satisfied in their prosperity, this is when Hosea began to speak. And so this is why it draws attention to this first king rather than the last king that would have been alive during his prophecies. If Hosea had begun to prophesy after the death of Jeroboam, after the decline of Israel had begun, he might have been seen as having developed his negative prognosis based on a present view of things, which would not have been prophecy at all. But Hosea prophesied the desolation and exile of Israel while the kingdom was strong fortified with many strongholds. They had a a strong standing army. While the nation enjoyed peace and prosperity, this is when the word of the Lord through Hosea promised death and destruction. After the superscript, our text today, chapter 1, verse 2 to 2, verse 1, is a subset of the initial section extending all the way to chapter 3, verse 5. And and this section encapsulates the message of the entire book. It introduces a three-part formula that is found in every single one of Hosea's sermons. The pattern is this, accusation, judgment, and hope. And this cycles over and over and over in Hosea. Accusation, judgment, and hope. Every other section relies heavily on this first one, and we're going to take a a few extra minutes this morning because we also had to do the introduction. Everyone relies on this first section because this initial word of God is sprinkled with narrative description of Hosea's obedience and about Hosea's family life, which results from obeying the unique command of God. Hosea's family becomes the sermon. Hosea's family is the prophetic oracle which forms the basis for everything else that is said in this book. All of the other things Hosea has to say points to this dramatic image of Hosea and his faithless wife. Verse 2, prepare yourself for some jarring language. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, the Bible only has this term 12 times, and six are found in Hosea, and he uses up a full half of them here in this one sentence. It is meant to be a jarring statement. The command is meant to offend and confuse us. This activity of Hosea is meant to shake God's people to their senses. We should be shocked. God commands this of his prophet. There are alternative translations that perhaps soften the term which is found in our ESV. Adulteress is is somewhat helpful but is misleading because Gomer was not yet married. Promiscuous 
is insufficient because the Hebrew term does not describe what she might do, but what she actually does. And the Hebrew term is plural to convey how repeated, how characteristic such infidelity was. Whoredom describes literal acts of illicit lust, often with financial or material gain involved. But it is also used here to describe religious acts of infidelity, the abandonment of worshiping the one true God and taking on the idols and myths of paganism. Notably, in Hosea's day, this was worship of the Baals. The relationship between these two meanings, the literal and the religious, should not be missed because much of the message of Hosea turns on this. The wife's literal whoredom is a persistent illustration of Israel's religious fornication. Hosea's marriage to Gomer was to symbolize the fact that the land of Israel was full of people who had departed from the Lord and committed adultery by their involvement in the fertility religion of Baalism. The children both the literal children and figuratively in the metaphor, are not only the result of the wife's unfaithfulness, but they take after their mother in her unfaithfulness. The children and the mother are not always differentiated in the metaphor, but when they are, Israel is the wayward wife. And and that is representing the leadership, institutions, and culture of Israel. The children are the ordinary men and women who are trained and nurtured in that culture. They become children of that nation. And so if the nation is unfaithful, the nation does not produce faithful children. The nation produces unfaithful children. And so God is married to the nation, but now the nation has begun to produce uh, children who, who are not the product of their union with God. And so Hosea's marriage to Gomer was to symbolize the fact that the land of Israel was full of people who were adulterous. The reason for God's astonishing command to Hosea is given that the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. In other words, God specifically tells Hosea to enter into the same kind of marriage that God himself is in. Hosea is to experience the sorrows of God. Hosea is to speak in God's place to the nation as one who has actually experienced what God is experiencing in his people's unfaithfulness. Hosea was to be bound to this immoral woman in covenant union, for better or for worse. The path of his life would be joined with hers. He would be like Yahweh, who also bound himself in covenant with a willful and wayward people. And God, too, knew that his people would be unfaithful when he bound himself to her. Now, many commentators throughout the ages have struggled that Hosea would do such a thing. And especially that he would be commanded by God to do such a thing. And through real, no real good arguments, they have concluded that such an act would disqualify Hosea from prophetic office, that he could not be a godly man if he intentionally bound himself to an immoral woman. But Hosea's obedience in this matter is his only qualification to speak for God. This is the pivotal theological moment of his life. More than a tragic episode, it is the foundation of Hosea's ministry and his qualification to speak for God. Now, I I feel the need to insert a caution here. You are not a prophet. And even if you do feel that God is speaking to you, he will not contradict his written word to you. We are commanded, 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? God commanded Hosea to do something that seems wrong otherwise, but this does not give you or I license to rebel against God's commands whenever we feel led in some other direction. It's also important to understand that Hosea's wife of whoredom is a representative of God's people. Hosea represents God in the analogy. His wife represents us. 
Hosea's wife is of Israel. She represents Israel and is no worse sinner than the rest of the unfaithful people she represents, only more obviously. I think it's also important to recognize here that we may find ourselves in situations which are somehow other than the ideal because of our own past sin or the sin of others. We may find that we are married to an unrepentant sinner, or we may have been divorced, or have a terrible past reputation, or any other thing that might seem to hinder us from what we see as God's best plan for our lives. But I want to encourage you now, church, if you belong to God, if you have entrusted yourself to Him for salvation and have dedicated yourself to seeking His will, you are not disqualified from God's great plan for your life by your situation. You have not derailed God's perfect plan by your past, the sins you have committed, or the sins of others against you. Everything that has taken place up until now, everything that God has allowed has uniquely positioned you for your service to God. Hosea finds himself married to an adulteress. And someone could say, well, that disqualifies him from Christian ministry. That disqualifies him from doing the sorts of things that God would have him to do. It is the opposite. It is the painful thing that he's going through that makes him one that can be used by God in exactly the way God has planned. So also with me. So also with you. Hosea, according to the will of God, found himself married to an adulterous wife, And this made him uniquely qualified to speak for God on the issues of this book. As Hosea spoke for God, he spoke from an experience he had in common with God. Hosea has endured as a husband the same treatment God has endured as covenant Lord of Israel. More than any other, Israel had a right to speak on God's name. He has shared God's experiences and speaks with God's heart. Praise God he does this today in us, church. In knowing something of the bitterness of God's pain, Hosea was also able to portray the depths of God's love for an undeserving people. So it is with us. Notice that nothing at all is said of how Hosea felt about these matters or how he went about doing them at all. It it is a common thread in the prophets that God's word to them was so effectual that disobedience was unthinkable. As we work through Hosea, I, I also want to give us a bit of a crash course in the prophetic writings of the Bible and on the prophetic office. And so, as those who were carried along by the Holy Spirit, the prophets often speak of being unable to keep from doing what God has commanded. The prophet Amos said in in Amos 3.8, The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And who can forget Jonah, who did everything he could to refuse God's call? Jeremiah actually complained repeatedly about having to speak what God gave him to speak. Jeremiah 20, verse 8 to 9, For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. The word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there it is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shot up in my bones and I am weary with holding it in. And I cannot. The Apostle Paul speaks of his compulsion to preach the gospel in much the same way as the Old Testament prophets spoke of their necessity to prophesy what God laid on them. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. After the birth of his son, the word of the Lord came again to Hosea, Hosea 1, 4, and 5. The Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel, and on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Of Hosea's three children named here, 
Only Jezreel's requires much explanation, and it does require a fair bit. It is not used anywhere else in the Old Testament as a personal name, but it means God will scatter. The Valley of Jezreel was one of the most prominent battlegrounds in Palestine, the scene of many significant and violent events in Israel's history. Think of Gideon and, and many others. It was here that Jehu swept to power over all Israel in a bloody coup against King Joram, son of Ahab, and his mother, the wicked queen Jezebel. And the, the Ahab and Jezebel were so wicked that they were stamping out the true faith in Israel and promoting Baalism. They, they hired many priests of Baal to come and, and teach the people and, and lead them in grotesque pagan worship. They did horrible things publicly. Uh, paganism is, is quite a gross religion, really. And so God sends Jehu against Ahab and Jezebel and their son Joram. Je Jehu went on to kill every male of the house of Ahab, all of Ahab's close friends, and every priest of Baal that served him. Second Kings 10, 11. So Jehu struck down all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, all his great men and his close friends and his priests, until he left him none remaining. Now, the interpretation of verse 4 hinges on how we translate the Hebrew, uh, which more woodenly rendered says, call his name Jezreel, for in a little I will visit the bloodshed of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Now, our ESV translation understands this to be that God punished the house of Israel for the blood spilt at Jezreel. If we understand this to be God's judgment upon the current rulership of Israel because of Jehu's bloody purge, then it can be translated that way, that God punished the house of Jehu for the blood spilt at Jezreel. But this translation fails to see that Jehu's pogrom against Ahab's house and the cult of Baal was both commanded by God and rewarded by God. Listen to 2 Kings 9, 7 to 8. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And then at the end of the story, God expresses his approval for what Jehu had done and rewards him for it, 2 Kings 10, 30. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes. That's, that's pretty significant, right? Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart. I don't think I've heard a commendation like this anywhere else. Because you did exactly what was right in my eyes, and you did to them exactly what, all that was on my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So he's rewarded with assurance that for four generations they would rule. The whole nation of Israel is not being punished for the bloodshed at Jezreel. Rather, it is punished for not learning the lesson of Jezreel. Jehu himself had been the agent of God's fury and had personally seen how God's fury fell terribly on an apostate dynasty, those who had turned away from God. But he and his household went on to repeat the exact same sin. They did exactly as their predecessors had done. God visited the bloodshed of Jezreel, the same type of calamity, on the house of Jehu, because in the final analysis, his dynasty's rule was little better than that of Ahab and Jezebel. Jehu's actions at Jezreel were, if anything, the main reason God had waited to eliminate his dynasty. Israel had already seen how God dealt with the wicked rebellion in his destruction of Ahab's family. Now, the same sort of destruction would be experienced by the nation as a whole for not learning from it. So God is visiting the blood of Jezreel upon 
the house of Israel. He points to the bloodshed that had already happened, this, this horrible bloodshed really, except for it was under God's command, and, and says this kind of calamity is going to come upon you now for your disobedience. To break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel communicates much the same thing, that God would break the military might of Israel. This is tantamount to announcement that the nation of Israel itself will come to an end. The entire prophecy tied up with the naming of Hosea's first child was that the violent and bloody situation at the beginning of Jehu's reign would be followed by a violent and bloody situation that would end the dynasty of Jehu. Now, looking back from our standpoint, in retrospect, Jehu's dynasty did only last the four generations promised by God. And around 30 years later, the bow of Israel was broken in the valley of Jezreel when the army of Israel was defeated and the nation was taken into exile by the Assyrians. This is the name Jezreel. God will scatter his people. Verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. Regarding Jezreel, the author had recorded that Gomer conceived and bore him a son. The text does not explicitly connect Hosea with the conception of the second or third children, which leaves us wondering, I believe intentionally, whether Gomer had been unfaithful to her marriage vows and whether these children were really Hosea's at all. The daughter's name is a word combining the Hebrew particle meaning no or not and the passive form of the verb to have mercy. So no mercy to me sounds like it could be a cool wrestler's name, but this is a name that's saying it's the daughter who is not pitied, who is not shown mercy. It's not, it's not like I will have no mercy. No mercy means no mercy for this one. In Greek, it is translated, not loved. And this is how the New Testament quotes it. A commentator named Garrett writes, It is a dreadful name to give a little girl. It communicates rejection by her father and says that he has abandoned her to all the troubles of the world. For a culture as child-centered as Israel was, it is difficult to imagine a name that is scandalous and offensive. Not pitied, not loved, is a, a far more terrifying name than Jezreel because Jezreel's ambiguous. This is not. This needs almost no explanation. Israel's national identity was built on God's mercy, his compassion and tender commitment. Israel is defined as those who are experiencing the mercy of God. For ethnic Israelites to be called those who will not receive mercy foreshadows the name of the next child to follow. It becomes readily apparent that at least some of Gomer's children and the Israelites at large were not the people of God. The judgment conveyed by this name is made all the more harsh by the terrible promise that all forgiveness will be withdrawn. Now, all of this is given in contrast with a brief mention of Judah's deliverance. Judah and Israel were the people of God together. They had split into two nations. They had had some, some civil war. And so, even as he promises destruction, complete destruction for Israel, and announces, you are not my people, he says something of Judah. God would continue to show mercy to Judah and save them, though not through military might or instruments of war. God had always promised to preserve a remnant of Israel. And their ultimate salvation is connected to the house of David in the tribe of Judah. If no mercy points towards the ultimate expression of judgment upon the northern tribes, 
The brief mention of Judah hints towards the hope that is expressed at the end of this chapter. Verse 8. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. With the naming of this third child, the signs of the judgment have reached their climax. The statement here is an exact reversal of the basic covenant formula between God and his people. Exodus 6-7, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. God had bound himself to his people in this formula of a marital covenant. But the covenant with Israel was not unconditional quite unlike the new covenant today in Christ Jesus. Israel was promised, Exodus 19, 5 to 6, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Not my people signals a total change in God's relationship to Israel. The waywardness of the nation has effectively annulled the covenant. The son's name not only described how Israel has behaved as if they did not belong to God, but it also declares God's response of making it clear that he is separated from them. In a dramatic statement, God reverses the name by which he was known to his covenant people in the last clause of verse 9. It does not just say, I am not your God, but it literally reads in the Hebrew, I am not I am to you. God had chosen intimacy with his people. He had entrusted to them his personal name, written with vowel, or without vowels as Y-H-W-H. Yahweh, or I am, signified the presence of God with his people in the revealing of his name. Not I am actually sounds like a reversal of the divine name in Hebrew. So calling himself not I am cancels the significance of the covenant name YHWH, rendering it null and void with respect to Israel. It announces God's absence from them. What greater threat than for the name to be unknown? And soon Israel would forget the name of God completely losing the ability to pronounce it, even to this day. Calling the son of unfaithful Gomer not mine is a scathing accusation of marital infidelity. And the birth of this third child actually signals the beginning of a a period of separation between Hosea and his wife. It doesn't say it here, but when the narrative picks it up again, God will instruct him to go back once again and love an adulterous woman. So it it becomes clear later that this, when he, she has a child and he's like, not mine, that signals their separation. Much like God signals his separation from this people with this name. Like Hosea, God would no longer be with his bride because of their habitual unfaithfulness. Now, these are shocking things to say. Is God unfaithful to his people? Just as Romans 9 to 11 describes, God has not rejected his people. God will always be faithful to his people. But God's shocking statement here in Hosea is that this generation currently dwelling in Israel is not my people. Paul writes Romans 9, 6-7a, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Just as Hosea was married to an adulterous woman who bore children of dubious descent, God is married to Israel. But generations of unfaithfulness had given birth to a generation that did not know God. They were not his people. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So God is always faithful to his people. 
And he is married to an adulterous woman, the nation as a whole. But this generation that now lived in the land was not his people. They were the result of generations of unfaithfulness. Another husband had conceived them. It is not the punishment of God that makes the people of Israel at this point stop being his people here. It is the true judgment of God to say that they already are not his people. Today, in the church, there are those that expect that God will save them no matter what. He has to, doesn't he? God has promised to be faithful to his church. We claim to be his church, and we think that we are safe, for God cannot deny himself. If we take this for granted, we are deceived. Many have usurped the title of church, yet are alienated from God. Many were raised by parents who were part of the church and are alienated from God. They fail to consider that they are covenant breakers. They fail to consider that they live manifestly as enemies of God. The Bible says if we love the world, we are the enemies of God. They fail to consider that taking on the title of Christian does not make it so. And so God announces to a people here that calls themselves Israel, you are not. After scathing accusation and pronouncing terrible judgment, every section of Hosea ends in expressions of glorious hope. Verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. This positive promise begins with the reminder that in the future, God will fulfill his promises to Abraham and Jacob and multiply the people in Israel like the sand of the sea. This present destruction, this this will not prevent God from fulfilling his original plans. The time of God's wrath and destruction will one day end, and God's blessing will revive the people. And then in that place, that is in this land of Israel where it was said, you're not my people any longer, it will become apparent that these people are children of the living God. In verse 11, the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. By Hosea's day, the political division between Israel and Judah had already lasted for 200 years. The reunion of these two nations under one leader harkens back to God's covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Each of the names of Hosea's children is transformed here by, from a sign of judgment to a sign of God's grace. No mercy, you just scratch out the no part, it's just, it's mercy. Not my people, you scratch out the not part and it just becomes my people. Jezreel, on the other hand, is still ambiguous. God will scatter in the sense of judgment can also mean God will sow, as in scatter seed in a different context. God will both scatter in judgment and then later sow in the restoration of Israel. On the great day of God's sowing, Jezreel, the decimated population of Israel will rebound. The people would come up out of the earth, which implies a resurrection. On the metaphorical level, the verse describes how people spring up like the grass of the field as they are restored. God is sowing and the people are being restored in the land. And on the theological level, it asserts that they will rise again from the grave. Another common theme in the prophets. That God would take the dry bones of Israel and breathe life into them by his spirit. That he would raise them from the dead theologically. All true salvation comes from such a conversion as God breathes new life 
into one who was formerly dead spiritually. The first stage of fulfillment for these hopeful prophecies was the return from exile, begun in the days of Cyrus, 539 B.C., and continued for nearly a century through the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. This return was viewed as a reunion and restoration of the two kingdoms because the people were still Jews, that is, of the tribe of Judah, and yet they returned to the land altogether as Israel. But the the post-exilic era, coming back into the land, lacks both the royal leader promised in verse 11 and the population explosion of verse 10. The return from exile was often characterized by austerity, even poverty, not this glorious provision of God. When the new temple was built, for instance, the elders who had seen the former, former temple wept because the new temple did not even come close to comparing to the grandeur of the former. Indeed, the Old Testament closes by reaching beyond itself and longing for the day when the promises of righteousness in God's people, glory and prosperity, which are found in almost all the prophets, would be fully realized. This left room for a further fulfillment in a second stage, the birth of Jesus as the Messiah who is the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, to David, and to the people through the prophets like Hosea. He is the Davidic king, the descendant of David, in whom all the people of God are unified. But even then, there is still room for fulfillment. The formation of the church is the third stage of fulfillment to what Hosea has prophesied here. Both Paul and Peter quote Hosea and use the word play found in the names of the last two children and apply them to the incorporation of Gentiles into the covenant. Jezreel was just too ambiguous, so they just take the last two. As Gentiles are brought into the new people of God, Romans 9, 24 to 26, even to us whom he has called, Not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says to Hosea, Those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Peter, 1 Peter 2.10, Once you were not a people, But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Even so, there is still room for fulfillment. The fourth and culminating stage is the return of Jesus Christ. The full display of God's sovereign love and perfect judgment. Though the bright promises of Israel's future can be broadened to embrace Gentiles like you and I within the church, the formation of the church does not exhaust these promises. Only at the return of Christ will we see all of God's people united under his kingship. Only at the return of Christ will we see the number of the children of Israel has become like the sands of the sea as a result of God's great sowing and through the inclusion of believers from every nation, tongue, and tribe. The final glory promised here in Hosea it still awaits us. By comparing Israel's sinful behavior with the vile behavior of an immoral and adulterous wife, Hosea reminds his audience then and now of both the seriousness of sin and of its effects and of the amazing greatness of God's mercy and love. Unfaithfulness to God in Israel and in the church cannot be ignored. Either people are believers and are faithful to their commitments to God or they are not a part of the family of God. They are not and cannot be members of God's family unless two things happen. First is the great mercy of God that though those who have gone before us have failed, even though the church has been unfaithful throughout the ages in different times, God is still faithful to his people. God must first love us in spite of our sins, which he does. He must show mercy to those who do not deserve mercy. 
He must love those who do not deserve to be loved. And then we must respond to God's love with a new commitment of love for him. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Something that God is both giving us the desire to do and the ability to do through his spirit and his word and his church as we encourage one another all the more as we see the day of Christ coming soon. Church, unless we respond to these warnings of Hosea, a book that is, is totally pertinent to us today, we should have no certainty of our salvation. Just because we call ourselves God's people doesn't mean it's true. And God announces clearly in Hosea, and again today, those who do not belong to me, will be, it will be made known, if not before, at the day of Christ's return, at the judgment well, he will separate the wheat from the tares. He will separate the sheep from the goats. He will separate those from the visible church who are his people and those who are not. Let's pray. Father, as we meditate on this word this week, I pray that we would not be stalled out in any one section. I pray that we would hear the accusation that can be rightfully pointed sometimes at us. I pray that we would hear the judgment that you proclaim upon a people who called themselves yours but were not, and we would fear you. And Lord, I pray we would also meditate on the great hope that your loving kindness, your tender mercy is always available to us. May we, the church, this morning turn to you in repentance. May we allow your word to do its work and cut out from us the things that are hindering us from serving you. Help us to abandon our sin. Help us to abandon our trust in other things and turn wholly to you as your children do. And help us to have true assurance of salvation as your Spirit does a work of sanctification in us, producing the fruits of the Spirit in greater and greater measure. Lord, I pray for each one here. I cannot see, as Christ did, what is inside of a man, but you, God, judge down to the division of joint and marrow. You know exactly where we are at. And Lord, I pray that you would apply your word to each one of us, as you would have it. In Jesus' name I pray.